Hello, my name is Brian Weiner. I'm an assistant professor of music education at Butler University in Indianapolis, Indiana in the United States. Hi, I'm Becca Matson, and I'm a junior music education student at Butler University. So we're going to be discussing uh, Becca's experiences as a disabled music education major um, at, obviously, an American school of music of around 200 students um, in a private university of around 5,000 students. Now, the discussion of ableism within higher ed in general and music education specifically is not necessarily a new one. Uh, we've been having um, these discussions for around the last decade, decade and a half. Um, and in general, we found that there's a recognition of basically a tacit acceptance that music study is inherently ableist. We'll be getting into that. But notably, a um, few of these studies have really elevated the voice of a member of the disability community as part of those discussions and has rather been uh, a third party being part of that. So the purpose of um, our research for the past two years um, has really been to capture Becca's experiences as a disabled student within a music education program and looking at how um, our institution has responded to her very unique needs. Our approach for doing this has been a critical case study and very specifically have utilized several narrative approaches to gather her stories as well as those uh, with whom she works, myself included. So this has involved multiple opportunities for Becca and I to engage in interviews, as well as storytelling interviews with many of the faculty and staff with whom Becca interacts regularly. And uh, before we go any further, it's critically important that we bring Becca's voice into this, and I'd ask her to share a little bit of who she is, um, particularly in terms of identity. Um, so the important things to know about me are that I grew up in foster care, um, and basically the only issue I had coming into college was that I'm a hard of hearing student. Um, shortly after I arrived at college in August of 2020, uh, I collapsed on the floor of my dorm room and I became a hemiplegic. What that means is that if you drew a straight line down my body, the right side doesn't work. That included my right arm, my right leg, and at the time, the right side of my face. Since then, I've made some significant progress with that, but I still use a wheelchair, and I've been diagnosed with a slew of other life-threatening diseases and illnesses that impact my daily living. Now, an important part of uh, Becca's part of being in our music education program has been her transparency and willingness um, to share exactly what her experiences are um, so that we're able to respond um, appropriately to make sure that she has access. And I'd like to share the words of Mike Colburn, who is our director of bands and Becca's Euphonium studio teacher. She, she's not a complainer by nature. She doesn't like special treatment, but but she acknowledges, okay, I, I, I need help, you know, accessing these buildings and, and, and doing these things. So um, seeing that quality in her made me even more sensitive to, okay, so what, what can we do? What should we do? to allow Becca to have as full of an experience here as possible. So a key part of Becca's success has been that we have a village that has been brought together. Uh, that's certainly inclusive of the various faculty members who have worked with her. Um, this also extends to our administration and our service team who have played a really critical role in supporting Becca in all the various ways that are different and unique to her condition. Um, and then not Last but not least, her friends, which we won't hear their voices in this, um, but they are absolutely a part, a critical part of that communication. So in our time that we have here together, we're gonna to be looking at these three major themes of identity and ability, dialogue, and accessibility. To get started, as we look at the concept of identity and ability, um, it's really critically important that we recognize that ability is a social construct. And I'm gonna let Becca explain that in her experience. All right, so when we open up the conversation um, about abilities as a construct, the example I'm gonna use here is that I'm hard of hearing. Now, for the purposes of this conversation, I wouldn't normally use this term, but I'm going to use the term hearing impairment. So physically, I cannot hear as well as someone else who is able-bodied. I have a hearing impairment. There is no denying that. But even with my hearing impairment, I still do everything else that an able-bodied or full hearing person does. I do aural skills with my hearing impairment. I tune my instrument with my hearing impairment. I play the piano with my hearing impairment. I do all of these things both despite and I would argue because of my hearing impairment. So then what makes this an impairment? What makes this something that is bad and something that negatively impacts my daily life? And I would argue that it isn't actually what is wrong with my ear. It's the attitudes, actions, and beliefs that other people have about my hearing impairment. 
So then going into language, the way I kind of like to describe it is there's basically two camps of language. There is person first and there is identity first. And person first says we will only see you and we will never see your wheelchair, we will just see you as a person. And this has great noble intentions. And then on the other hand, we have we will recognize that you're in a wheelchair and we'll see you as nothing but a wheelchair. And that also has great noble intentions. But the reality is, is that if you're going to view me as a person and you're going to see me for who I am, you have to have them both together. And the reason why is if you just see me as a person, then you deny me what I need. And if you just see me as a, as a wheelchair, then you fail to recognize who I am. You have to put those two together. Because at the end of the day, my wheelchair isn't a handbag. It's not something that I drop at the end of the night or choose not to carry in the morning or put off to the side. It's a fundamental part of me and it's a fundamental part of who I am. And I use the term disabled person because like anything else, it's my identity. It's something I'm proud of. It's not something I'm ashamed of because the only thing that makes it bad is the attitudes, actions, and beliefs of others. And so if you have to say person with a disability in order to view me as a person, then I would argue that you didn't see me as a person in the first place. One of the things that has helped as Becca has come through the program is the willingness of all of the faculty working with her to see both disability and person. I'd like to share Jeff Gillespie's words. Uh, as far as evaluating, I mean, my goal was to, to figure out what she can do, what she can hear, what she already knows. Um, I feel like initially, she didn't know what she could do. It seemed like she wasn't real confident about her hearing mm -hmm. or didn't think she could hear much of anything. Right. And so uh, my initial goal was to first of all fall, find out what she could hear and be positive. Right. You can do this, you can do this, you can do that. Um, and let's make a list so that she's aware of what she's able to do already. So when we look at Becca's experience, it is really not just about uh, one set of needs or one set of identities, but really this closely intersecting um, combination of looking at her experience as an academic, as a scholar, her experience as a social being, her need for personal wellness, um, and the fundamental needs that undergird all of that. And by bringing those together, we as an institution are better able to understand how to support Becca and how to make sure that she's an integrated part of everything we do, just as every other student in our program is an integrated part of that program. Um, one of the moments that allowed us to get into this was our ME 102 class, which is a foundations of music education in the first year. And Becca's going to talk a little bit about one of those experiences. Yeah, so ME 102 was one of my first experiences when I returned as a right-sided hemiplegic in a wheelchair. Um, and at first it was incredibly awkward. You could tell that people didn't really know how to interact with me. They weren't really sure if they should help or if they shouldn't help. And at one point about a month in, um, I sat down with my professor, Dr. Marsh, and she basically said to me, Becca, have you noticed it's awkward? And I said, oh yes, I've noticed it's awkward. If you're noticing it's awkward, I feel it every day. And so we had a conversation and um, it was amazing. She offered me the opportunity. She asked if I wanted to introduce myself to the class, essentially. And of course they had already met me by name, but you know, the elephant in the room is me. And so the next day I went in and I um, basically just went in front of class and said, hi, I'm Becca. I'm a right-sided hemiplegic. And I explained to him what that meant. And I explained a little bit about my other conditions and we, we talked about it. And what I primarily told them, and this is my opinion and what I prefer, is that I would just rather them ask. If they were wondering if I need help, they should just ask. If they were wondering something about my condition, they should just ask. There might be a time where I say, hey, like, that's a good question, but don't ask another disabled person you meet on the street that, but they should ask. And so we had this conversation, um, and I noticed a shift in my classmates, and it definitely helped with some of the intersectionality of those identities. Um, that you see here definitely um, helps with my social belonging. Um, just that I felt after that conversation, like my classmates understood a little more and they were certainly more comfortable in interacting with me because they understood that I am just like them. I might not have working legs, but I can still do and interact with them in all the same ways anyone else can. So this idea of dialogue has become a really critical piece. And this is um, certainly dialogue between peers, but with every person in the institution that Becca interacts with. 
like all institutions, we have our documentation of that. And what you see here are the pages of Becca's accommodation letter, which is certainly a good start, but it really doesn't allow faculty to understand who Becca is and how best to interact. And in doing that, we've created what we have affectionately called the process. So what the process consists of is essentially a system for me to interact throughout my time here at the university. Um, so one of the first things I do um, is when we're looking at my professors ahead of a semester, we think about who might be best to work with me. Because the reality is, is that I have unique needs like any other student. And if we can find faculty that are best suited to help me meet those needs, then that's a great thing. So we pick my faculty and then typically before the semester starts, I'll go have a conversation with them and I'll essentially lay it out just like I did for you earlier in the presentation, but perhaps with a few more details directly related to their class. And we have a conversation about what I need, how I work, how this all works, and I let them know about some of the resources that are available to them when they're working with me, such as Dr. Widener. And I'm also in constant communication with Dr. Widener. So usually after I have that faculty conversation, Dr. Widener will then send an email. So my role is essentially to come in and say, everything she's told you is correct. I am here as a resource, and let's talk about how we can best uh, facilitate Becca's learning and what has been successful in other spaces. And likewise, then open up that dialogue for that return of, I have found this to be successful. Becca and I have discovered something that really works, and can we share that with everyone else? Um, Becky Marsh, who you heard mentioned earlier, um, accounted for this uh, first initial part of the process in her words. I felt comfortable asking her questions because you had said, Becca's totally comfortable to talk about XYZ. Um, so just asking, hey, like, tell me about you. Nice to meet you. Here's class. Here's some of the things. What do you think you might need? What questions do you have? Do you anticipate, like, are there things that have gone well with other faculty members? Like, what am I probably going to suck at? Also, let me tell you, I'm going to suck at some stuff mm -hmm. when it comes to making sure that you have what you need. So just tell me. You won't hurt my feelings. And let's just check in. So an important addition to this triangle is my friends. Um, so fortunately, I have a lot of friends here at the university that I interact with regularly. Um, and they're a fundamental part of my life here. A lot of times we're in the same classes and things. Um, and so with my permission and, you know, with me updating, they serve as a great system of support for me and a great and a fundamental part of this network. Um, so they're able to talk to me and they're able to see perspectives that I wouldn't necessarily give the faculty. And then they're able to tell Dr. Reiner, like, hey, like I noticed that today in RL skills or today in keyboard skills or today in ME 101, whatever, Becca's struggling with X, Y, or Z. And it gives Dr. Widener valuable insight to then come to me and say, hey, like I heard that maybe this was an issue or maybe this happens. Can you tell me more about it? So they've played a critical role inside and outside of the classroom with helping in that network. And this has been seen really at all levels. Uh, David Murray is our director of our School of Music, and you can hear him talk about that role of peer mentorship and peer camaraderie. So it's finding the right student mentor for any you know future students yeah. that we have. Yeah. Um, and also making sure that we know maybe who the faculty member, whether it's an advisor or applied teacher or classroom teacher, that that particular student really feels most comfortable communicating with. Yeah and support that relationship. One of the elements that has most supported Becca in her time here is that there is buy-in at every level of the institution to make sure that she has full accessibility to courses, to buildings, to all of our programs, and when that doesn't happen, that there's a responsiveness to that. So this is engaging all of our administration, all of our support services, but recognizing that um, those services are constantly changing and constantly shifting and that it's not only Becca who needs that support in how we account for her unique needs, but essentially every person that is in this network um, at times needing additional resources, additional support, so that we can best meet everything that Becca needs from us so that she can be fully engaged, fully part of our community, um, and actively learning in every class. And we hear this um, from the dean of our College of Arts, Lisa Brooks. And then when I got back, I think then you had shared some of the legal stuff, and I wrote to him, and I said, you asked me what we could do. We need to get her housing. We need to get her something that we can do. And of course, he doesn't know how to do those things, but he was able to connect me. He said, let's bring Melissa Smearton in. Let's talk about, let's see what we can do, and kind of 
with his stamp kind of guy. So this idea of bringing a community together really leads to our final point, which is that of accessibility. Making sure that we're not just talking about accommodation, making sure that Becca can get into a classroom, uh, that Becca can have a, a way to get to the coursework, but rather that there's accessibility of the activities of the actual learning that happens. Um, within music study, one of the difficulties that we immediately encounter, especially as an instrumentalist, is that we are inherently ableist. We presume full function of two arms, or in the case of drum set, two arms and two legs. We presume that music teachers all come in with the same set of abilities uh, in perception, in mobility, in, in, in intelligence, in all of these sorts of things. And we really don't have great models of what it looks like to not only make music accommodating to all students, but truly accessible. So when we consider how to work with me in the classroom, there's basically two different things that we try, and one is accessibility and the other one is accommodation. Um, I largely prefer accessibility over accommodation. Um, so essentially what accommodation is, is accommodation is something that we make specifically for me. It's something, for example, what you see in the photo, which is the way I play euphonium. Um, I play it with my left hand instead of my right. And the reason that this would be an accommodation is it's because it is something that only I do. It is essentially saying Becca has to do it this way and everybody else would do it differently. Now, in a case like playing euphonium, this makes sense. The reason why is there's a specific reason that we play it with our right hands, typically, um, and it's beneficial. So there's a benefit to playing it the other way, which is why even though I have to do it differently, everybody else doesn't just start doing it the same way. With that said, with other things, we try to achieve accessibility. And essentially what that is, is it's sort of a universal design type thing where we do something like build a ramp or include closed captions. It would be, for example, if we were to play a video on a screen, we would just put the captions at the bottom. Now what that does is it obviously helps me as a hard of hearing student because now I can see what's going on in the video. Um, or I can see the lyrics to the song that we're listening to in music theory. Um, but it also can benefit other students. It's an accessibility measure. So if another student is distracted or just learns better by reading, then they can also benefit from that. It's an accessibility measure. It's a universal design. Um, and so whenever we can, we try to employ accessibility measures as opposed to accommodation measures because it integrates me in the classroom and does not signal me out as a disabled student. Because whilst it's part of my identity, it's not the only thing I am. And there's situations where it doesn't need to be signaled out. Um, and so when we're searching for those answers of accessibility versus accommodation, it's definitely a trial and error process. There's been times where we've tried things and it just simply hasn't worked. But there's been other times where we've tried things and it surprisingly enough has worked. Um, the goal is not to be perfect. We understand, and I specifically understand, that we're not going to get it right the first time. There's never going to be a time where I walk into a classroom on my first day and I automatically get my live captioning to work. It's not going to happen. Um, he's chuckling because we try it for weeks at a time. Um, but as long as we're trying and as long as we're making improvements and doing the best that we can, then that's what matters because eventually we'll figure it out. Um, and so one of the biggest things for me is I don't want to be, as I say, I don't want to be wrapped in bubble wrap. Um, one, of, one of my struggles is that when people see me as a wheelchair user, they oftentimes, because of ableism, see me with pity um, and see it as something that is bad and want to protect me from like not being able to do things the same way. And so they say, oh, well, you don't have to do that or you don't have to do this or we'll just take that away. And that's not what I want. Um, you'll see, I mean, here's me playing euphonium, and the last slide was me playing drum set. Um, I don't want it to be something that is that we're afraid of. I want to be able to try, and I want to be able to do all of those things. Um, and those best efforts might not always meet my needs, um, but as long as we're improving and as long as we're working towards it and working together and my faculty are willing to work with me, then I'm totally good with it. So we're hoping at this point that technology will work the way it's supposed to work and that we can engage with you one-on-one, -on -one, um, or at, at least we can engage with you uh, virtually from wherever you're at. Uh, we thank you for joining us here today, and uh, we would love to welcome the questions and conversations that you have. Uh, and if you have any questions for us individually, please feel welcome to reach out to me, and 
If it's not a question for me, I'll feel uh, I'll definitely share it with Becca as well to make sure you get a response. Thank you so much for joining us today.